All right, good morning, everyone. And I wanna welcome you to our lectures and lattes for October. And this morning we welcome Lauren Butler from Nicholas Children's Hospital from the Sports Health um, Medicine Department, who's gonna be just, uh, discussing with us developing youth athleticism for our students. So Lauren, thank you so much for joining us this morning. And we will start off this morning with a prayer in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this opportunity to join together this morning. We thank you for the gift of Lauren and for the message that she has for us this morning. We ask, Lord, that you open our hearts and our minds to receive the information and give us the wisdom and discernment of how to best implement this for our, our students and for our children. We thank you and we give everything for your glory. It's in your most precious name that we pray. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And I will hand it off to you. Thanks, Mary. Um, so first of all, thank you for having me. Um, I always love um, speaking to parents. And um, as a parent myself, I have two young kids. I have a seven-year-old and a four-year-old, and we're expecting our third in December. So, um, you know, youth physical activity, developing athleticism, these are, as a, as a health care practitioner and a parent, um, these are things that are a very big priority um, for me personally and professionally. So I always love uh, giving these talks to parents and um, you know, I hope you take something from this that you can sort of implement with your own kids at home. Um, I'd like to keep the format pretty open. So please um, you know, feel free to unmute at any point and ask a question. Um, I may ask some questions to you. Um, rather than use the chat, I'd like it to be as interactive as possible. So um, you know, feel free to unmute and share your thoughts um, and we'll go ahead and get started. So currently, so just to give you an update on the state of youth sports, right? So how many of you um, have kids who play sports currently? So go ahead and sort of, if you, if you turn your cameras off and raise your hand or unmute, how many of you have kids that play sports? I do. I have to. Good. Seeing some thun thumbs up, and I, I definitely heard some some parents that that have kids that play sports. Yeah. So a, a lot of kids play sports, right? Um, but when we look at the youth sports industry, it's changed significantly over the last ten years or so, right? So, um, you know, when I grew up playing sports, it was definitely less competitive. There was less push to sort of. Um, specialize in one sport at a young age and dedicate my whole childhood life right to that one sport. It was really just sort of, you know, play whatever makes you happy and 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 that's it, right? It didn't kind of like run our lives. Well, currently, um, we're in a little bit of a different situation. So we have roughly 45 million children who play organized sports each year, and the annual cost ranges from $700 a year, which doesn't sound so bad, to $34,000 per year. So some families are spending $34,000 a year on a sport, which is insane. Um, there's increased pressure on children to specialize in one sport at a young age and give up other sports. Um, you know, some of the coaches are pushing them and saying that this is this is the only way that they're going to become an expert, right, at that one sport. Um, and so, unfortunately, what we're seeing is that um, these these trends are resulting in some some negative consequences for our kids, right? We're seeing early sport dropout rates, um, and surprisingly, despite all of the kids playing sports, uh, physical activity in general is declining. When we look at sports participation trends, we know that that transition from elementary school to middle school is sort of a critical window of when kids either decide to sort of either continue with sports and maybe increase their sports participation or they give up on sports altogether. Um, and so what we're seeing is that pre-pandemic youth sports lost approximately 3 million kids um, from the transition to elementary to middle school. Um, we don't yet have the data on post-pandemic, but I'm going to have to assume that's probably even higher than that. Uh, but that's a lot of children from, you know, elementary school to middle school who have just given up on sports. Um, baseball lost the most kids, approximately 2 million fewer participants for ages 13 to 17 um, than ages 6 to 12. So that's concerning, right? But not that surprising. When we look at baseball, um, particularly here in South Florida, Little League Baseball is one of the most highly specialized uh, sports uh, and one of the sports that has the most pressure on the kids to perform. So it's not surprising that they've lost the most participants. Um, and what we're seeing as well is that 70% of kids are dropping out of sports by age 13, right? So again, that, that transition from elementary to middle school is critical. And unfortunately, we're losing a lot of kids to sports participation um, during that transition. And 
what we know about sports, right, is that sports tend to be the primary means that our kids um, develop and engage in physical activity, right? So <clears throat> it used to be that physical activity was sort of a mix of free play outside, pick up sports with friends, um, PE at school, plus youth sports, right? Unfortunately, now youth sports tends to be that main um, source of physical activity for kids. And so um, this is an interesting kind of chart that shows how um, youth sports participation has changed during the pandemic. Um, what this shows is the hours spent playing sports per week um, for kids ages six to 18 and how that has changed throughout the course of the pandemic. So um, what's interesting is, so if we look at the total, this is not surprising, right? So pre-COVID, um, on average, kids were spending about 13.6 hours per week playing sports. Uh, during the pandemic, they spent about 7.2 hours, so almost half. And then, um, you know, during as COVID sort of has continued, um, still we're sitting at that 7.2%. Now, I would expect that number to be back up a little bit now. Um, we don't have that data yet. Um, but, you know, physical activity in general was sort of cut in half during the pandemic. But if we dive a little bit deeper, the data is actually more interesting. So um, what I expected was at least, you know, at least we would see free play change, right? We would see potentially um, a decline in sports participation hours per week, but maybe an increase in the amount of free play that kids were getting per week because they're home. Um, I don't know about you all, but we definitely spent a lot more time outside riding bikes, taking walks, doing things in the neighborhood um, during COVID. Um, but what we saw was was not that, right? So before COVID, kids spent about 3.6 hours engaging in free play. Um, and during the pandemic, that dropped to about two hours per week. So that actually declined. Um, and if we look at virtual participation in physical activity again, which is something I would have expected to rise significantly during the pandemic, it really didn't change very much. Uh, Pre-COVID, we were about, about 1.5 hours per week of like virtual physical activity. Um, and during the pandemic, that only rose to about 1.7, 1.6. So um, some interesting data that um, sort of wasn't in line with what I was expecting in terms of physical activity trends during the pandemic. So when we take a look at youth fitness trends, right, we know we have a big problem, right? So um, pediatric obesity and decreased physical activity is a major public health concern. Um, fewer than half of kids meet the recommendations for being physically active approximately 80%, so think about that number, right? 80% of adolescents are not getting that 60 minutes per day of moderate to vigorous physical activity. And 30% of uh, children ages 10 to 17 are overweight or obese, okay? So this is a big problem. We also know that muscular strength in youth is declining. So if we look at data from 1980 on the pull-up test, um, the 50th percentile for kids ages six to nine was six to 10 reps. Now it's declined to two to four reps, right? Which is not surprising at all. I don't know about you, but my, 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 my seven-year-old definitely cannot do a pull-up. Pull um, so muscular strength is, in youth is declining. Um, and unfortunately, that muscular weakness tends to track into adulthood. So um, weaker kids are less likely to participate in sports and physical activity. Um, they're more likely to suffer injuries while doing so, and then they're less likely to be physically active as adults. Um, so it's really important that we as parents, um, you know, try to help combat this problem um, while our kids are young and help develop those healthy trends for physical activity and sport participation so that they can grow up to be healthy and happy adults. So I wanted to cover with you um, what we consider the core principles. And this was developed um, by a strength coach named Rick Howard. Um, and I love the way that he sort of put this into a framework that I think really helps um, sort of conceptualize how we should go about helping our kids to develop healthy athleticism that will support them uh, not only in their sport participation, but in their lifelong um, you know, journey to health and wellness. And so when we look at the core principles, core stands for context opportunities, recognition, and environments. And we're gonna go through each of those. So when we look at context, we know that the context in which children need to apply movement patterns needs to be developmentally appropriate. So what does that mean? So with our younger children, so elementary age children, the focus really needs to be on providing opportunities to develop fundamental movement um, patterns. So fundamental and foundational movements, which we'll talk about in just a minute. 
And then as um, our, our children approach maturity, so middle school, high school years, then that context is going to change to more sports specific movement patterns, right? But we can't move on to sports specific movement patterns if we haven't mastered the fundamental movement patterns, right? Um, and what this does is it ultimately builds a foundation of what we call physical literacy. Uh, so physical literacy is both movement competence, so my, as a child, uh, my ability to move and to move well, and movement confidence or, you know, my self-perception of how well I move, right? Um, kids who don't have both movement competence and movement confidence are less likely to want to be physically active um, and participate in sports. And this makes sense, right? So if I am a seven-year-old and I don't feel like I'm very good at sports, I'm going to be embarrassed, right? I'm not going to want to participate in sports and therefore I'm going to sort of shy away from physical activity, right? So we want to make sure that we are developing physical literacy in our kids so that they are equipped to participate in sports and physical activity without feeling that, um, feeling that they are not um, confident in their movement. <clears throat> so when we look a little deeper at physical literacy, um, it's defined as the ability, so again, the competence, the confidence, which ultimately lead to the desire to be physically active, right? And it's um, composed of three main components. So fundamental movement skills, which we'll talk about a little bit more, um, fundamental sports skills, and the ABCs, which stands for agility, balance, coordination, and speed. So we look specifically at fundamental movement skills. These, um, these are your building blocks. So think of these as your ABCs, right? So when our kids are in pre-K, kindergarten, they're learning their letters, right? They're learning um, the sounds, they're learning how to kind of combine letters to form words, right? Um, if they don't learn their letters, then they're never going to go on to be able to read and write and do all the other things that we expect from them academically, right? So the same is true for fundamental movement skills. So your fundamental movement skills are your building blocks for higher level sports skills and physical activity. Um, so these are broken down into two categories. We have locomotor skills, so running, jumping, hopping, skipping, and object control skills such as throwing, uh, kicking, catching, et cetera. So if a child hasn't mastered these skills, for example, if a child has not mastered the ability to throw a ball, then they're not gonna wanna participate in baseball, right? So what happens is when kids fail to master these skills, they sort of hit what we call a proficiency barrier um, for going on and continuing with physical activity and sport participation because they don't have the movement competence to do so. It's suggested that fundamental movement skills should be mastered um, by age 10 or roughly around um, the end of fourth grade. Um, but unfortunately, what we're seeing is that um, these kids are, are not mastering these skills even well into the middle school years. So in one study in 2015, we found that only 11%, so 11% of seventh graders had mastered all of their fundamental movement skills, right? So that means that close to 90% had failed to master all of these skills. Um, and boys score higher than girls. So girls are even more or less likely to master these skills. Um, we also know that there's a positive correlation between physical activity, sport participation, and motor competency. So this makes sense, right? Um, again, if a child doesn't feel competent and confident in their movement skills, they're less likely to want to participate in sports. When we look at um, the other two components to physical literacy, we have uh, the ABCs and fundamental movement skills, right? So first our kids have to master those fundamental movement skills and then they have to master the ABCs and fundamental sports skills. So your ABCs are agility, balance, coordination, and speed, right? And this I think is very clear how these ABCs directly translate to sports later in life. Um, when we're developing these skills in our younger children, um, the, the focus is a little different, right? So we, we achieve agility, um, you know, not necessarily through specific sports drills, right? But we achieve agility through climbing, through jumping, through uh, navigating unstable surfaces on a playground, um, different, uh, providing them with different opportunities for movement, which we'll talk about um, a little bit more. Speed, right? Like, how do we promote speed in, say, a five year old, right? Think of games like red light, green light that we used to play, right? It doesn't have to be at this age and it shouldn't be um, very sports specific. It just needs to be within that context of providing them um, with the opportunities to develop these skills. 
And then we look at fundamental sports skills. So before you can play a sport, right, you have to learn the um, fundamental components of that sport. So for example, if you have a child who wants to learn how to play basketball, they first have to learn how to jump, right? They have to learn how to catch a ball. They have to learn how to dribble that ball. They have to learn those basic skills first and master those skills before we can even consider teaching them how to play the game of basketball, right? So the next um, letter in core is opportunities, right? So we must provide kids with opportunities to develop their skills. And there's multiple ways that we can do this. Um, we can provide them opportunities through physical education, through free play, and through, through sports participation, right? Um, but we wanna make sure that we are providing kids with multiple opportunities to develop these skills. And I think that that becomes very challenging. So um, unfortunately, um, funding for physical education, at least in the public schools is very low. It's about $700 per year per school, right? Um, that's, that's almost what the, the low end of what parents pay for youth sports is, right? And that's what we're spending on our entire year of PE curriculum, which is pretty concerning. Um, so unfortunately, kids are not getting the quality PE that they should be getting um, because there's just not enough funding for it. Um, and we look at free play, right? I mean, <clears throat> if we look at how busy our children's days are from going to school, participating in extracurriculars, participating in their sport, doing their homework. Um, if you're working parents, you know, sometimes your kids are in aftercare until 5 p.m. It's very difficult to schedule time for them to engage in free play and outdoor play, right? It's, it, it's like the first thing to sort of get knocked off the list because there's just way too many competing priorities. So we're left with sports participation, again, as that primary means of providing them with that opportunity to develop their skills. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, sports participation and sports in general, um, the goals of sports has changed and shifted a little bit um, from providing opportunities to develop skills, to have fun, to develop relationships with peers, to winning. And we'll talk about um, the impact of that here in just a minute as well. Um, we also want to provide kids with the opportunities um, to develop the physical attributes of athleticism. So in these opportunities, they should have a chance to build muscular strength and endurance. Well, what does that look like, right? How do we provide kids with the opportunity to develop muscular strength? If we're thinking of an elementary school um, child, this can be as simple as climbing, right? So let them climb a tree, let them um, get on some of those, the playgrounds that have some pretty, you know, intense climbing um, apparatus and let them learn how to climb. Um, <clears throat> we wanna make sure that they're developing cardiovascular endurance so that they're running around, they're getting their heart rate up. Um, they, you know, we wanna make sure that they're getting that moderate to vigorous physical activity each day. Um, and I think that it's important to understand that sports alone does not prepare our kids um, to be physically strong and fit. And I love this quote. Again, it's by Rick Howard. Uh, youth need to get in shape to play a sport, not play a sport to get in shape, right? So we know that unfortunately um, in youth sports, there's a lot of time sitting on the bench. There's a lot of time standing around, especially in the younger kids. They're out there you know, twiddling their thumbs and my kids do it too. Um, so they're not really getting the amount of physical activity that we would actually think that they're getting from that sport. So we need to make sure that we're providing them with these opportunities to develop that strength, that baseline level of physical fitness to help support their sport, right? We can't just assume that the sport provides it to them. <clears throat> As we look a little bit deeper at youth sports, I kind of alluded to that youth sports have changed quite a bit and, and that this might be part of the problem, right? So there's this um, push for early sports specialization. So, you know, I'm sure those of you who have kids who play sports have already felt this pressure from coaches that, you know, they really want um, your child to play one sport and stick to that one sport. They don't really want them dabbling in other sports because they feel like, um, you know, it'll take away from the sport that they're playing. Um, unfortunately, the that's not what the data shows us, right? So it's easy to sort of assume that the more I focus on this one sport, the better I'm going to be at this one sport. The more likely it is that I'm going to play in college, the more likely it is that I'm going to play professionally. This is definitely the right path, right? I mean, logically, that makes a lot of sense. Um, but what we're seeing is the opposite. So when we look at um, the U.S. Olympic Committee, 
we see that seven out of 10 Olympians grew up playing multiple sports, right? We also see this in professional athletes that many professional athletes didn't actually choose their primary sport until like during high school, right? They grew up playing other sports. Um, so what we know is that kids who specialize in one sport early, which is defined as choosing one sport at the exclusion of others as early as age six, right? So we have kids who choose to specialize in one sport at age six. Um, this results in earlier dropout. So again, they sort of burn out by the time they're in middle school and they don't wanna play that sport anymore. So they quit sports altogether. Um, and it also results in early peaking. So if you have an athlete who's specializing at age six, right, they're gonna peak in their sport at age 12. That, it, that's not helpful in terms of going on to play in college or to play professionally, right? We don't want a 12 year old to peak. Um, on the opposite side, if we look at sports sampling or multi-sport participation, we see that multi-sport participation provides opportunities to improve gross motor coordination. So it exposes them to a, a wider variety of movement skills. Um, it results in longer sporting careers and sampling has been shown to be a predictor of elite performance. So again, professional athletes, Olympic athletes had a history of sports sampling um, in their younger years, not sports specialization. So I think this is something that as parents, um, even though it's extremely hard because there's, and especially as the kids get older, there's a lot of pressure for them to choose one sport. I think we have to sort of remind ourselves that maybe that isn't what's best for them and we should allow them to um, explore multiple sports. Um, the other aspect of this is, you know, perhaps that's not the sport for them. So if, you know, if we ask our six-year-old to specialize in one sport and they decide that they just don't really like that sport and they've never been exposed to another sport, they're just going to drop out of sports altogether. Um, or the child who, you know, I mean, how many of you have kids who don't want to play sports at all? and just say, you know, you ask them why, oh, I don't like sports, it's not for me, right? I, I prefer music or I prefer this, which is great, but maybe they haven't tried enough sports to try, to really find that one sport that speaks to them, right? And there's so many sports available. You know, we have to think outside the box. It's not just, you know, soccer, basketball, baseball, but what about dance? What about rock climbing? What about archery? What about bowling? I mean, there's so many different sports um, I think providing kids with the opportunity to explore all of that, we're more likely to help them to find something that they enjoy. And then when we look again at opportunities, I mentioned that we need to provide um, youth with the opportunity to develop strength, physical fitness, cardiovascular endurance, those kind of things. Um, so I wanted to touch on this because I think it's a question that I get asked all the time is, um, you know, this is all great, but is it safe for my, my kid to um, perform? strength training is it safe for them to lift weights right um there's a lot of myths out there that lifting weights will stunt your child's growth or lead to different injuries um but what we know is that for kids who participate in resistance training programs the benefits far outweigh the risks right so um, benefits of participating in a youth resistance training program um, results in increased muscular fitness so muscular strength endurance and power improved body composition increased bone mineral density, uh, decreased risk of injuries in sports. So remember that quote, we want to we want to make sure that their bodies are prepared for sports, right? Sports alone doesn't prepare them. Um, it can result in changes in self-confidence and improved motor function. So um, participating in youth resistance training programs has a lot of benefits for our kids. Um, we also know that resistance training skill competency is a significant predictor of muscular fitness. And then again, um, I have a question. Can mm -hmm. I interrupt you? What yes. is resistance training? What do you mean? Is lifting weights or yep. exactly? Oh, okay. Yep. So resistance training. So it doesn't have to be um, necessarily lifting weights, although that's usually sort of where it heads. Um, but it's it's engaging in an activity that causes an increase in muscular strength. So um, when we talk about resistance training in kids, right, we always want to start with body weight exercises. So um, resistance training for a six-year-old, for example, may look like body weight squats, um, teaching them how to do a plank, teaching them how to do a knee push-up, um, how to do a pull-up, how to hang on a monkey bar, right? That's a form of resistance training that would be appropriate for that age range. As the child develops proficiency with those resistance training skills, right? So they can squat with good form, um, 
you know, they can perform a push up with good technique, then we can start adding load um, in the form of weights, right? So there's really no um, minimum age recommendation for adding weights um, to a child's resistance training program. It really just depends on, you know, is that child able to follow instructions? Um, are, have they mastered first their fundamental movement skills? Have they been able to demonstrate that they can do squats and, and the proper technique with some of those different strength training activities? Um, and if they can do that, then you're ready to go ahead and add weights. Um, and, and that's been shown to be safe and beneficial for kids. Um, obviously, we want to keep some safety things in mind. So we want to make sure that um, they're always lifting weights under supervision, that we're giving them um, verbal and visual feedback to help identify sort of any, you know, lifting faults that they're demonstrating. And again, make sure that they're mastering those skills with body weight first um, before adding any sort of external load. Um, but resistance training, again, you know, it can involve adding external weights or just simply using body weights. It just depends on the child's um, ability to handle the type of training and um, their maturity level. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions before I move on from this slide? Because I know this is typically one that we get a lot of questions on, um, on safe, safety of resistance training in kids. Yeah, I do have a question. Mm -hmm. um, where can we find information about a um, program for resistance uh, training? Um, like programs available in the community or information yes. on res Okay. Yep. So um, I can actually send and I'll send it over to Mary to kind of send out through email. Um, at Nicholas Children's, we actually have a youth um, strength and conditioning um, program available. So we have class group classes for kids um, ages six to 10, and then group classes for kids ages 11 and up. Um, all developmentally appropriate ways to engage in resistance training for kids. Um, there's a few other resources in the community. So I know the YMCA, um, I think offers a few different programs and there's some um, private gyms as well um, in South Florida, but it is a challenge to find um, places for kids, particularly younger. So once you get into the high school years, I think your opportunities sort of open up. Um, but for kids in that sort of age six to 13 year old age range, it's really challenging to find resources for them um, and places that they can go um, for safe um, resistance training, um, safe and fun, right? Um, so I'll be happy to send that information out to Mary so she can get out to you guys. Perfect, thank you so much, appreciate it. Yep, you're um, welcome. One question that I had was, I, I hear a lot about like CrossFit um, but I've also heard a lot about of injuries within CrossFit and I'm seeing a, like an influx just in my own community of children that are now engaging in that. Is that a form of like resistance training? Is that incorporated and is that safe for children? Yep, I think it depends on the kids. So we've seen the same thing. Um, so CrossFit is a form of resistance training, right? Um, CrossFit often involves external loads. So adding weights to the child. Um, and I think that, you know, CrossFit can be safe for kids and, and it can be beneficial just like any other form of resistance training. Um, however, before a child engages in kind of like a group CrossFit class, we wanna make sure again that they've mastered um, the fundamentals first, right? So have they developed enough of that, um, you know, the fundamental movement skills, those foundational movement skills to support their body and lifting weights, number one. Um, number two, have they mastered the specific skills that are going to be required of them during CrossFit with body weight, right? And so I think where that becomes challenging in some of these CrossFit gyms is that you have a wide variety of um, children who all have different baseline levels of strength and physical fitness. So, um, you know, if you compare, let's say they have two 12-year-olds in one class, right? One 12-year-old may be perfectly appropriate for CrossFit, Um you know, have that baseline level of strength, able to follow instructions, have good movement patterns without body weight, and they're ready to go. And that's a great candidate for CrossFit. Um, but on the opposite side, you may have that 12 year old who really has not even mastered their fundamental movement skills, right? Like they, they can't skip, they can't hop. Um, they certainly can't squat with good technique. 
um, that individual is not ready for CrossFit. And I think where it becomes challenging is in these big box gyms to be able to identify which kids are appropriate, which kids are not, not appropriate. And I think that that's sort of what's leading to injury. So I don't think it's that CrossFit is dangerous for kids. Um, I think it's that we're not appropriately identifying kids who sort of need to take a step back and build themselves up before going to that type of training, if that makes sense. Any other questions on um, youth resistance training? Okay, if you think of any, we can always come back to it at the end, so. Um, okay, so in our word core, right? Uh, we already went over um, the, the context and the opportunity, so now the R, recognition, right? We need to recognize that physical literacy can be achieved at any age, right? So again, coming back to our CrossFit story of two 12-year-olds one who has a, probably achieved physical literacy, fully appropriate to start CrossFit, and the other who has not, right? We need to be careful that we are not giving up on kids who have not learned the appropriate skills. And unfortunately, we see this a lot in youth sports, right? Um, you know, if you're not very good at sports, you're probably going to spend a lot of time sitting on the bench, right? Unfortunately, um, for kids in those elementary years up until age 10 or 11, we should almost be taking the opposite approach, right? We need to recognize that kids have the ability to learn these skills at any age um, and that not every child learns them at the same age, right? So some kids are early bloomers, some kids are late bloomers, right? That doesn't mean that the early bloomer um, is a better athlete than the late bloomer. It just means that that late bloomer hasn't bloomed yet, right? Um, and unfortunately, if we hold back the late bloomers and we sort of bench the kids who haven't mastered these skills, we're never giving them the opportunity to develop these skills. So imagine the amount of talent, if you're looking at it from a youth sports perspective that you're missing out on, right? Maybe that kid is, has an incredible athlete inside and has just never been provided with the opportunity to develop those skills because they're a late bloomer, right? So compared to their peers, you know, they're a little behind. Um, that, that just might mean <clears throat> they're gonna peak at a later age. <clears throat> and then we also have to think about the negative health consequences for the kids who maybe they're not going to be the most amazing athlete, but, you know, at least giving them that foundation for physical literacy, that confidence and competence so that they have a desire to be physically active so that they're not embarrassed to be physically active later in life. Um, <clears throat> if we deprive them from ever learning those skills, imagine how that kind of contributes to the overall um, public health issue that we have with um, obesity and decreased levels of physical activity, right? So I think that we need to remember, we need to recognize that physical literacy can and should be achieved at any age and we should never give up on a child. Um, again, and incorporate all aspects of athleticism into our sports practice. So again, I had mentioned before that sports has shifted and again, it's about winning. So that makes sense that the best kids on the team are gonna get the most play time. The kids who are struggling are going to be benched. Um, and sports practice is all about preparing for that next game, right? Unfortunately, it should be about preparing those kids to be healthy and happy adults, developing strength, endurance, flexibility, mastering fundamental movement skills, learning agility, balance, coordination, speed, um, having fun, right? Learning the social aspects and those benefits of sports. Like that should be the primary goal of sports, particularly in our elementary years. Um, and I think that we really need to try to hold coaches to a standard um, of getting back to that because that's what's going to best prepare all children um, later in life. And this <clears throat> is something, this model is something that's um, well recognized and adopted um, by the U.S. Olympic Committee. So I mentioned the U.S. Olympic Committee is a big proponent for um, age appropriate uh, sport participation and multi-sport play. Um, they've recognized that Olympic athletes come from a background of multi-sport play. They come from a background of um, inclusion and fun through youth sports. And so um, what they've done, the U.S. Olympic Committee has actually put together this pathway, what they call the American Development Model. Um, and what it does is suggests um, for, you know, ages zero to six, an active start. So providing opportunities to be physically active every day in a safe and fun environment. Um, ages, you know, six to nine, focus on fundamentals. So learn those, learn and master your fundamental movement skills. Um, and then ages eight to 12, 
learn to train, prepare your body for sport participation. And it's not until after age 12 that we truly focus on um, one particular sport. So when we look at developing athleticism in kids, um, I think it's helpful to sort of understand um, what is age and developmentally appropriate at each stage. And so I like to break it down into sort of three different phases, which is um, early childhood, pre-adolescent, and adolescence. And so if we look at early childhood, um, we consider this the investment year. So this is the time that we want to invest in um, the exploration and learning of a broad range of fundamental movement skills. And so this should largely be discovery-based learning. So these are your young elementary school children um, where you know physical fitness and components of physical literacy should be fun. They should be game-like, right? So think of games that we used to play, uh, red light, green light, tag, um, you know, the game in the picture, keep it up with balloons. Kids love these games. As parents, I think we sort of, um, you know, we think of physical activity now as just sort of sport participation and let's go play soccer. Kids get bored, right? They're just, they just don't wanna do that they want to be silly and they want to play games. And, and if we can kind of encourage them to play these different movement games, they're going to have more fun. They're going to want to move uh, and they're going to develop the skills that they need um, to participate in sports later. As we move into the pre-adolescent years, we consider this the sampling years. So think of this as your late elementary, your middle school years um, up until roughly around 12 or 13. This is that window where we want to expose our kids to a wide range of different sports and activities, right? Let them try as many sports as possible, help them to find that sport that speaks to them, that sport that they feel confident and competent in and that they want to continue throughout their life. Um, and then in the adolescent years, this is where we sort of make that switch to specialization and to really, hon uh, really honing in on that one sport. Um, and we also have to recognize though that in this, these adolescent years, not every child wants to play competitive sports, right? So some kids may just want to play recreationally and that is okay too. Um, we need to make sure that we hold on to rec sports and hold on to those opportunities for kids to engage in non-competitive forms of sports participation. <clears throat> and so now as we get into um, the last letter in our core acronym, which is E for environment. So, um, and I've spoke on this, I think quite a bit throughout, but just to sort of tie it together, um, organized sports have become the primary environment for developing athleticism, right? We've sort of strayed away from physical education and free play as other opportunities. Um, so we need to help sports get back to, you know, what it used to be um, and, and help our kids to truly develop athleticism. So Unfortunately, as we've discussed, youth sports, the focus of youth sports may be misplaced, right? So especially for elementary kids, the focus should be on fun and not on winning. In fact, kids who do drop out of sports, um, they've done a whole bunch of studies that have identified the number one reason they choose to quit is because it is no longer fun, right? So the focus on a youth sport environment should be centered around fun it should be positive and motivating, and it should provide opportunities for all children, right, to develop appropriate skills. Again, we should never give up on a child. Um, and so I love this. This is the Sports Bill of Rights. This was put out by the Aspen Institute, um, and it's sort of like the bill of the the eight um, bill of rights for kids to participate in youth sports, right? So every child should have the right to play sports, um, regardless of their level of motor competence. Um, they should be provided with safe and healthy environments. Um, they should, youth sports should be led by qualified program leaders who are focusing on fun, right? They should be developmentally appropriate, um, encourage opportunities for developmentally appropriate play. Um, we should allow children to share in the planning and delivery of their activities, right? Let them choose what they want to do. Um, they're more likely to do it if they have kind of a role in choosing what they want. Um, make sure that we provide equal opportunities to all kids. Um, make sure that we're treating all kids with dignity and respect and provide kids with the opportunity to enjoy themselves and have fun through youth sports. So I love this Bill of Rights. Um, so in summary, uh, we need to make sure that we provide kids with multiple opportunities to develop age appropriate skills, right? So as parents, what can we do? We can encourage more free play at home. Um, we can help be an advocate for our children through youth sports and look for youth sports organizations that you know, truly um, focus on fun. You know, it's, it's okay when choosing a sports league for your child to ask questions, right? You know, what is the focus of your practice? Um, 
can you give me a breakdown of what your practice looks like? If they say we spend 99% of our practice learning um, different plays, let's say it's football, run, right? Like you don't want them spending 90, a six-year-old percent spending 90% of that sport practice learning football plays, right? That should be a small percentage of what they're doing. So ask questions um, um, to those coaches. Make sure that we provide um, kids with opportunities to develop all attributes of athleticism. So remember, sports alone isn't enough. So make sure they have opportunities to develop strength, whether it's an older child that you want to sign up for a strength training program, or if it's a younger child who you simply just need to take to a playground and let them climb. Um, we need to make sure that we definitely don't give up on kids who aren't there yet. So kids develop at different rates and um, you know, we never want to deprive a child of the opportunity to develop these skills. Um, and then lastly, choose environments that support the development of athleticism and truly prioritize fun um, for kids. Because if they're having fun, they're going to continue to want to participate and to be physically active and to play sports. Um, when it's no longer fun is, is really when these kids give up. So um, I will stop there um, to answer any questions. So thank you for, for listening to this, uh, this talk. Sometimes I get on a soapbox at times with it, um, but I think it's really important information um, for us as parents to, to really start to understand. So um, any questions? Hello, thank you again. You know, it's so, there's so much misconception about weight training and resistance training with kids. And I was so afraid to let my kids do some training with me as well. And now you cleared it up for me. So I feel much better knowing that it's okay for them to do a certain type of training with me. Yeah. They enjoy it so much. And I was so scared, you know, but now thank you for clearing it up for me. That was honestly one of the key points that I had. <laughs> And you cleared it out for me. So I really appreciate your presentation. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. And I, I think that as parents, if we can, you know, when we can model um, healthy behaviors and encourage our kids to, you know, lift weights with us, or, you know, even if they're not lifting a weight, but if we're, you know, we're squatting and, and they're squatting alongside of us, um, they love it. They want to do what you're they doing. Do. Um, yes, they do. Yeah. They love to limit yeah. you. <laughs> Exactly. And so it's a great way to encourage them to be physically active. So that's awesome. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions? A question I had is what sport would you recommend for students who struggle with sports induced asthma? Yeah, so, you know, every child is every child is different and every case of asthma is different. So, um, you know, Luckily, we're in South Florida, where we don't have sort of like that cold, dry weather, um, which can be, you know, worse for asthma. So luckily, we have the humidity as our friend, um, which tends to be better for kids who are asthmatic. Um, anytime that you can get them into an environment where they're sort of breathing in that moist air can be helpful, unless their asthma is triggered by um, different allergies like pollens and things like that. So um, I think that's a good question to have with your child's, um, you know, physician in terms of what are the triggers for their asthma. So obviously if there are certain in, like environmental triggers, I would probably try to stay away from sports that, um, you know, have those triggers. So if they're, if um, pollen and things like that are triggers, then maybe go with indoor sports. Um, if, um, you know, the heat and the humidity and that wet air actually helps your child's asthma, then I'd probably go for outside sports. So I think that um, there's no kind of one answer to that question. It really depends on the cause of your child's asthma. And I think it's a good conversation to sort of either have with your physician or even just sort of self-reflect on and look at, all right, well, what are the triggers of my child's asthma? And then which sports sort of avoid those triggers and, and promote the environment that my child is better in. The other question I had was, I feel like there's a lot of opportunities to engage in physical activity, but one of my biggest concerns is in regard to the training that is behind the people who are offering the services. Is there something specific that we should be looking for, certifications, licensures, um, that maybe give us a hint of the background of the person yeah. who is providing the training? So that is that is a very um, kind of tricky situation, right? So how do you know that when you sign your child up to um, participate in a sport at a certain league that that coach is qualified? So 
Um, unfortunately, we know that the majority of youth sports coaches are, are parent volunteers. Um, you know, this is something that they chose to do probably because they grew up playing sports and they have a passion for it. Um, at the very least, you should be asking if that coach has had a background check. Um, you know, the majority of leagues make sure that their coaching staff do go through background checks. Um, some other questions that you can answer are, you know, is this coach CPR trained? Are they first aid trained? Um, have they gone through any sort of special training on how to work with kids, how to motivate kids? Um, unfortunately, I think what you're going to find is the, the majority of, of the answers will be no. Um, this is an area that I think youth sports needs to improve upon. I think we need to make sure that our, our coaches are provided with training in you know, CPR, basic first aid, um, how to work with kids and, and help them to achieve these skills, um, how to motivate children. I think, unfortunately, the majority of youth coaches um, again, they're volunteer parents who grew up playing sports, so they may not have the best understanding of a lot of these things. So um, on the opposite, I think, you know, some do. So if you ask these questions, um, you know, and, and you find an organization that has coaches that have been CPR trained, have been first aid trained, have some sort of training, while there's no certification, um, have some sort of training on how to work with and how to coach with kid, how to coach kids. Um, I think that those are, are great um, ways to, to identify that. Um, I will include in my email to Mary. Um, so the Aspen Institute Project Play has some really good resources available as well on um, organizations that have sort of like made a pledge to, um, you know, make sure that kids are provided with developmentally appropriate opportunities for sports participation. Um, and I can um, send the link to that list as well. Um, in South Florida, um, there's a few. I know the, the first one that comes to mind is I-9 Sports. I know that they've made the pledge um, for, for healthy sports participation. Um, I think there's a few others on that list as well. Um, so I can, I'll send that link over um, to Mary so she can send it out. I have a question, but more than a question, it's um, an advice that if you can give me. Um, I have two boys and they play sports and they love playing sports, but the problem is that uh, they always want to win, that, that, as you said. And I'm trying to focus and say, no, but you have to do it because you're having fun, you're spending time with your friends, but sometimes they get very upset. So I don't know what else can I, can I tell them or what do you recommend me? How old are your kids? One is 12 and the other one is nine. Yeah. So, I mean, and are they uh, boys or girls? Boys. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, some kids are naturally driven by the desire to win, right? Some kids are naturally driven by the desire to have fun and, and some are sort of like a mix between the two. So I think that, you know, if your children are driven by that desire to win, I think a healthy level, healthy level of um, competitiveness is appropriate, right? It's okay. Especially at, you know, at age 12 that, you know, that's when they really start to sort of develop that um, desire to be more competitive. So I think it's okay. I think we need, you know, all kids are different. All kids have different motivations. And if your children's motivation is to win, you know, I would obviously make sure that they understand that winning isn't everything. Um, but I would sort of just, you know, let them, let them be who they are. And if that's what motivates them, great. As long as they are having fun as well, um, and, you know, continuing to be physically active, then I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Yeah, sometimes, for instance, if they lose a game, the little one, he starts crying, you know? <laughs> but, well. Yeah, and, and that's tricky, right? And I think that that's when we, you know, we can sort of have those talks as parents of winning isn't everything. It's, you know, everything is a learning experience. Um, you know, there's going to be times in life, you know, it's just helping you to better prepare yourself later in life, but ultimately they're kids. They're, they're going to get upset when they lose and that's okay. You know, I think that's part of life and, um, you know, it's short lived. They move on the next day they wake up and they've already forgotten about it. So, um, as long as they're, you know, still having fun, um, I think that that's, that's totally appropriate. Okay. Well, thank you for the valuable information that you gave us. It was a great presentation. You're welcome. Absolutely welcome. Any other questions? Okay. 
So I will, um, I'm going to send an email to Mary with some information on our group fitness classes here um, at Nicholas Children's for Kids. And then I'm also going to include some resources from the Aspen Institute um, on, you know, how to find a sports league um, that is best for your child that's focused on the right things. And some other, I'll include some other links to resources as well based on some of the questions that were asked. So hopefully you find that helpful. Um, if there's anything that you as a resource would like that I don't send, I'll include my email as well. Um, feel free to shoot me an email. And if there's something specifically, um, you know, that you're looking for, I can help you find that resource as well. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you thank so much you. for taking the time to be with us today. And um, we really appreciate all the wonderful information. And I'll be sure to send that out to everyone. Absolutely. My pleasure. All right. Thank everyone you. have a great day. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you. All right. Take care. Have a great day. Bye. Thank you.